Is there any truth to this belief? Waiting on deck with the answer is Dr. Howard Brody, professor of physics at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Welcome to the program again, Dr. Brody. Thank you. Now, you study the impact of uh, the ball and bat, right? That's right. Now, do you believe that the metal bat makes it easier to be a better hitter? Yes, I think you'll get more power out of a metal bat. Why do you say that? Because you can make a metal bat lighter than a corresponding wooden bat. But I always thought you want a heavy bat. You want to get up there with the biggest piece of lumber that you have. No. No, that's not no. right. This bat is already six times the weight of that ball. If you make it seven times heavier, you'll hardly influence how much momentum is transferred to the ball. So then what influences how fast the ball is going to go when you hit it? The bat speed. And we can demonstrate that now. All I'm right. going to release this bat, hit the ball, and then the distance the ball travels will tell you how fast the ball has been hit. What's the science that we're talking about here? We're, we're transferring momentum or energy from the bat to the ball. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'll watch. Here we go. Uh, looks like... About seven. All right. Point about here to me. Now I'm going to take this 28-ounce bat and convert it into a 36-ounce bat by putting this weight on it. So we're effectively making the bat heavier. Right. But I'm going to release it from the same place so it'll have the same speed when it hits. Ready? Go ahead. Whoa. I'd say about only eight at the most. It just went up a little bit. Just a little bit. And I would have okay. thought that it would have gone a lot further. So it's not the weight of the bat that's That's right. Hits. Now what I'll do is move this marker back a few inches. Mm -hmm. and release the bat from here. It'll now have a slightly higher speed when it hits the ball. And okay. let's see what happens. Ball goes up to about uh, 11. Right. It went so, a, lot f a lot farther, that means a lot faster. Right, so the slightly higher bat speed ended up with a much higher ball speed, which means the ball will go over the fence more often, go by the infielders much more quickly. Yeah, but there were guys like, like Babe Ruth who used to use very heavy bats and they hit home runs all the time. Well, Babe Ruth was a great big man and he had tremendously strong shoulders, arms, and chest. For the average person, a lighter bat can be swung faster and I can demonstrate this to you. All right. We have here a radar gun that I can measure your bat speed and if you'll swing that heavy wooden bat. All right, everybody stand back. No need to. Notice my umpire here, he's the only umpire in the world that uh, you can call a dummy and get away with. Sorry about that. Here we go. All okay. Right. I'm ready to time it. Here we go. That's 45 miles an hour. Not bad. Now you Not wanna bad. try the aluminum bat, which is about eight ounces lighter. All right, let's try the aluminum bat. Are you ready? I'm ready, you ready? I'm ready. Is everybody ready? Yeah. Here we go. 53 miles an hour, that's pretty good, Ira. Not bad, it was really a lot faster than the wooden bat there. Right. So by going to the lighter bat, you got a higher bat speed. Now why can't you just make a wooden bat lighter instead of going to a metal bat? Well, you can make a lighter wooden bat, but it would have some disadvantages. For example? I could make a very thin bat, but then you'd never hit the ball. It'd be too skinny. <laughs> right. I could hollow out the bat, but that's illegal. I could cut a nick out of the end, but that would hardly save you any weight. Or I could make a much shorter bat <laughs> to save weight. Well, this Little League bat, you know, it's short. You'd never hit the low outside pitch with this. That's right. It's too short. So what you do is go to an aluminum bat. And here's an example of an aluminum bat that's been cut. This is it. This is amazing. It, there's really nothing inside of it. Right. Sometimes you can fill that with a foam just to deaden the sound. Mm -hmm. But this is a full-sized, full-length full bat which weighs considerably less than the corresponding wooden bat. Well, why don't the Major League teams just give in and go to the metal bat? Well, they were afraid that pitchers would be injured. Really? As it is right now, if you hit a line drive right at the pitcher, he just has barely enough time to get out of the way. You go to a better bat, that ball will get to the pitcher faster. He wouldn't have time to get out of the way. The pitcher will be injured. That little difference would count then. That's right. The second thing is that all the records that have been accumulating for 100 years would be destroyed by the <laughs> aluminum bat. It'd have a little asterisk on the records that say a post-aluminum period. That's right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Brody, for coming and pinch hitting for us today. We're going to swing away right into our next part of the program in just a minute. More party trivia. Fascinating fact, number 78, Beatles. Thousands of dermestid beetles are chewing away at collections in museums throughout the world. The insects are not a menace. They're professional cleaning crews. With voracious appetites, the beetles are efficient at cleaning skeletons being prepared for display. They are picky eaters, preferring to work on lizards but detesting snakes. Like my new shades, 
You may enjoy wearing polarizing sunglasses like I do, but how many of us really understand what's going on inside the little sunglasses there? What does polarizing mean? What's it all about? Well, here to help us understand this common everyday phenomenon is Ruth Gaiman from the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Welcome to the program, Ruth. What, are, what is happening inside sun sunglasses like these? Well, polarized light is light that vibrates in a single direction. A single direction? What do you mean by that? Well, that's a little confusing. Let's see first what polarized light is. Okay. We have here a polarizer, just like in your sunglasses. It looks like I'm looking through the lenses. Just mostly. like you're looking through the sunglasses. Okay. You turn it, nothing happens. Nothing happens. But if we take a second polarizer... It gets a little darker. A little darker. Turn one of those. Turn one. Look at that. It, now it gets it, it blocks out the light totally. Is this what's happening inside my sunglasses? Somewhat. Let's explain a little further with an analogy over here. Okay. This is an analogy of what we just saw, the two polarizers in opposite directions. These pieces of glass with the slits in them will be our polarizers, and this spring will, be, will help us to explain light. Light okay. is a wave, and if you make a wave on here, you're making a wave analogous to light wave. Mm -hmm. Now, light waves, before they get to a polarizer, can vibrate in any direction. Every way. Sideways, Let's make waves up and down, going every... all directions. All right. But when it goes through this slit, the spring can only vibrate in one direction, and oh. only the vertical waves can come through. This is what we call polarized waves. So when the light goes through one of my lenses here, that's the what happens. The waves come out in one, vibrating in one direction. If we now take put a second polarizer in front of the first, going in the opposite direction, only the horizontal waves will go through. But the vertical waves cannot, and there should be no waves coming through at all on this huh. side. So that's like looking through both of the polarizing filters. Like looking through both of the polarizers, no waves come through. Yeah, but Ruth, you have to explain something. I don't have two polarizing filters. I only have one on, on my glasses. What's the analogy here? Well, first, let's say how these are not like your polarizers. Your polarizers in your sunglasses do not really have little slits in them. I don't, I don't see little slits in them. They're actually made <laughs> of a plastic material that absorbs part of the light and lets part of the light through. Okay, now how, how do you explain only one lens on here? Well, when you look through it, you're trying to get rid of glare, the reflected right. light off of the roadway or off of water if you're fishing. Mm -hmm. That glare is already polarized. It is? How is it polarized? Just by bouncing off? By reflection off? at a certain angle, that light is polarized. So then if the, these lenses up here are polarized in the other direction, that glare doesn't get through. Exactly. And so you have Mother Nature helping you out then. All right, very good, Ruth. Now tell me, there must be some wonderful other uses you can do for polarizing lenses. Well, sunglasses are only the tip of the iceberg with polarized light. Let me show you something else we have over here. Myra, what do you think we have here? It looks like a beautiful piece of stained glass to There's me. There's no stain and no glass in here. Are you kidding? What is inside of that? Now, what's in here is just little pieces of cellophane tape cut overlapped into this shape. You mean these tiny little pieces are clear cellophane clear tape? Clear cellophane tape like you can buy in a store. Well, how do you get the colors in Sandwiched there? between two polarizers. So the question is not only why do you see color, but why can you see light at all? Try Ooh. turning it and seeing if you can block out that light. You're right. This is beautiful. If the polarizers are in here, I should be able to block out the light like I did at the front table. But I'm just, I'm just changing the colors. What's going on? Well, the light coming from the back enters one polarizer. It then is vibrating in only one direction. Right. But when it hits the tape, that direction is twisted by, by the material the in the tape, and it can now get through the second polarizer. So that's how it gets out between the two polarizers. But why does the light have the colors here? If, you know, what, where do the colors come from? Well, they're not really in the tape. They're in the light itself. Light is a mixture of all colors of the rainbow. And as the light comes through the tape, different colors by the layers are being twisted different amounts, allowing different colors to come out as you turn the polarizer. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. But is there some practical use you could make besides nice stained glass windows like this? Oh, yes. Many things will twist the light and show colors between the polarizers. We can study crystals this way in a polarized light microscope. So these are crystals under, under the microscope? Under ordinary light, they would just look black and white or would be perfectly clear. You wouldn't see them at all. Mm -hmm. The polarizers allow us to see them and to study the different structures of the crystals. Now, what other kind of wonderful uses can you do with polarizing light? Oh, it's used all the time for engineers, use it for stress analysis. It's mm -hmm. used in photography for filters and even for 3D glasses. <laughs> the old 3D glasses, well, these aren't like the old ones. The old ones had a little red and green filter in it. These just have polarizing filters? Just polarizers. Unlike your sunglasses, one filter goes one way, one the other way. 
so that they can project the movie in polarized light with two projectors. Well, thank you very, very much, Ruth. This has been very enlightening. We'll be back with the rest of the program in just a minute. in the audience now for our next question. And this time it comes from? Gus File. Gus, you had an interesting question. Why don't you share it with everybody? Yes, I, I'd like to know what happens when we dream. You, you dream a lot, Gus? Not too often. Yeah, but you like to know what happens when you do, right? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Here to answer that question is Dr. Jan Seary, biologist from McAllister College in St. Paul. Good to see you again, Jan. Thank you. Uh, oh, I see you have Ernie's got a little bear Yeah, here. well, he, we're going to talk about <laughs> sleep. And so Is that he, cute? He wanted to bring his bear. Okay, well, anything that makes him feel well. Let's <laughs> talk about sleep and dreaming. Okay. What's going on here? Well, we don't know very much about what happens when you dream. But uh, we do know that there's as much electrical activity in your brain when you're dreaming as there is when you're awake. No kidding. And so there is something going on. Yeah, there is. Uh, Ernie brought his brain here uh, <laughs> to talk about this a little bit. The electrical activity that's going on is going on here in the cortex. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you think. But if we look a little bit deeper into the brain, down here into the brain stem, this is actually where dreaming is to trigger. Really? Yeah. There's a spot in the brain for that. Yep. 